this one's on. Okay, to begin with, my name is Mike Beckerman, and today is November 7th, 2013, and I'm in Corinth, Mississippi. Tell me your name. Christy White. Christy, uh, you understand we're making a video of this, right? Uh, I do, and I do indeed. And we have your permission to do that? Yes. Tell me where you were born. I was born in Boonville, Mississippi. It's just uh, about 18 miles south of here. Uh, I grew up in a, a small little, it's not even a town, a community uh, called Cairo. And it's, it was r right in the, um, the corner of Alcorn, Prentice, and Tishomingo counties, uh, which made up all Tishomingo County before 1870. Uh, my grandparents, one set lived at Jacena and the other set lived at Ryanzy. So both were in Alcorn County, and uh, I was pretty much raised in this area. When we did our grocery shopping and such, we came to Corinth for the most part, and uh, they said that just the, the county county girl we did we did things that all country kids do you know climb trees play in the mud puddles <laughs> uh, my grandparents my armstrong set of, of grandparents actually lived on the court square at jason so uh we i what me and when i say we my sister my cousins we really grew up around the courthouse really not realizing the historic significance of it until till later we just kind of used it as a as a huge playhouse you know we'd run up the stairs and sit in the courtroom and pretend that we were having court and and things such as that and uh jacena had been such a flourishing community before really before the civil war came along and uh there if you look back at the records now you can find uh saloons and there were schools and hotels and looking at it these days you you couldn't tell there's a church and the courthouse is still there and a fire department and a community center so but it was once flourishing and when we were young playing and as i told you before we got on film uh there were so many wells in that small community that my grandparents would warn us not to not to get in the whales because they were frightened. I know there were three or four just on their property. Uh, so you can imagine uh, what was near a whale, you know, if it was this. And my, my grandfather had a picture of the old jailhouse and uh, they hung people at the old jailhouse. So uh, it was there, it's not, it's not there any longer. Uh, now the Jacinta Foundation uh, runs the courthouse. It was scheduled for demolition in the 1960s and, and some folks saved it. There was one lady from here in Corinth who actually laid down in front of the bulldozers to keep them from raising the, the courthouse. That's about an 1854 uh, structure. There was one there before and then they built that one. So. Um, now it's a museum. They have what's called the Old Country Store uh, right across. They have a park there. The Old Country Store, as a child, uh, they sold ice cream cones for a quarter. <laughs> so uh, we were always begging my grandmother for uh, a quarter, and we would just walk to the store and from her house and get a, a big cone of ice cream. And I know the ladies worked that worked in there. Uh, we we got a lot for our quarter, <laughs> so uh, we we were always doing little odd jobs for my grandma as well, so that we could go and get ice cream at the courthouse. And um, every year on the Fourth of July, they have a, a Fourth of July festival, political speaking. It's grown into the second largest speaking behind the the real famous Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi. Uh, and that was always a really fun time and uh, you could socialize, the politicians were there. Uh, it's that, and so that's that's my childhood uh, there. Uh, the other side, my, my grandparents um, on that side had been farmers forever. My great-grandfather lived right in, in Ryanzy. He had been a justice of the peace, so he married lots of people. He was also a farm manager for um, some of the, the notable families, the Bynum family down in Ryanzy. He was their farm manager. Uh, like I said, he was he was just right there in Ryanzy, and we uh, grew up at his house, but that side of the family really had a rich farm tradition. And going back, uh, we were just, they were just the small substance farmer, you know, the yeoman farmer, as they say, no slaves, anything like that. Do you um, know when they came to Mississippi? My mother has been doing quite a bit of research. I think they, they, were, they were in Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, and they came down to Mississippi uh, prior to the Civil War. Okay. 
and you went to school where? I went to high school at Newside High School, and it's down in Prentice County. Uh, when I when I graduated from there, I went to Delta State, which is in Cleveland, Mississippi, and uh, got a match of not a bachelor's in history, and then I went to Mississippi State University and got a master's in history. Okay. And uh, before I was quite finished with my master's, uh, my my husband's a pharmacist, uh, so he went to Ole Miss, and we uh, <laughs> we dated the whole time so when he came back he he got a job here i was finishing up my master's i was actually in the thesis portion of my a master's um my my thesis was life in old tishomingo county okay. and uh did a lot of research there as far as uh during the civil war uh, looked at uh, civilians looked at the civilian soldier relationships and then the soldier soldier relationships so um I was finishing up my thesis and when I did that I actually got a job working for our Chamber of Commerce which at that time the tourism office was part of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I, I got a lot of experience. I, I, I did that only a year while I was doing that I also started um, volunteering at our local museum on Sunday afternoons with um, Mrs. Margaret Rogers. Uh, Mrs. Rogers had been a third grade teacher here. She was, uh, I'd say, I, she they live, her father was actually an overseer of some uh, farming operations as well. So I think she was born here, but they moved out, uh, they moved to Alabama, but she came back. She became a teacher. She taught at the Alcorn Agricultural High School, which is Kossuth now. Uh, and then she came back and taught in the current school system. There's a lot of folks here who had Mrs. Rogers for a third grade teacher. And uh, when she retired from that, uh, she helped start the local museum. And uh, for a long time, it was a little hut. And uh, we had traffic in and out. Of, we, we had, not only we had tourists, tourism uh, was really getting to go and, you know, say about 15, 16 years ago. And, um, but then we had a lot of locals who would come who would just want to reminisce with Mrs. Rogers. She had a wonderful mind um, in that she could, she remember who lived where, she remembered them from school. So she was, she was just, a kaleidoscope almost of, of learning for me and um, I, I at, at the end of the year that I volunteered she actually wanted to step back I think she was 88 <laughs> so she decided that she needed to rest a little bit so um, the board at the museum opened the job and uh, I applied for the director and that by that time I'd had my master's I'd finished my thesis had my master's so I got the job at the museum with the understanding that Mrs. Rogers was always coming back. You know, it, it was one of those times where I was almost um, in a holding pattern because I loved her so much from the year that I spent with her. Uh, I there were, there were things that needed to be done with the museum as far as to improve it, but at 88 years old, there was nothing that I felt like couldn't wait until... Mrs. Rogers couldn't come anymore because it was her her baby, so to speak. And she had done such a wonderful job of collecting. Uh, people would come in and, and, and give the museum things, but she never minded. She got to the age where she never mind asking people <laughs> for things. And you would have people come from all over the country um, chasing Civil War relatives, and they might have a letter. Uh, they might have a diary excerpt. And Mrs. Rogers always would say, can we make a copy of that? So she had a wonderful vertical file of um, just maybe some excerpts. And, and of course, that's before the internet where you could get everything, uh, you know, at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. So she had a wonderful vertical file. Um, so she and I worked to inventory the collection. And at the same time, you know, after in the tourism business, you know, uh, after October through about March, April, things are kind of dead. <laughs> so uh, uh, it was almost, I would say it was like we had fireside chats, but there wasn't a fire. There was this huge heater that sounded like the building was about to blow up <laughs> uh, there. But um, sh there was a stream of folks, and, and there are several special people that I would like to, to uh, talk about. There was Miss Rogers would sit and hold court, so to speak. Uh, there's a gentleman named Clifford Worsham. He passed away. Um, a couple of years ago and Hugh Horton and he passed away more than a couple of years but Hugh had been a um, postman uh, 
then Mr. Worsham had been a builder, engineer. Had, he was very colorful. We have actually have his World War II. Uh, and they would sit around and they would fuss and fight about who was right about this kind of things. But I, I just got to be a witness to all of that. And that's where a lot of my knowledge um, came from with, with the things in Corinth. So Miss Rogers stayed at the museum for another, I'd say five or six years into her early 90s. And then her health began to fail. And at the same time, um, there was some grant money available for uh, transportation projects. So we were able to uh, get a grant for the depot here. It's a 1918 structure. Uh, it, it the, the one before that burned on its own fruition. Uh, the one before that I think was, was burned when the Confederates left town uh, in, in 1862. But uh, we had this wonderful opportunity to make the depot our local museum. Okay. Uh, which we were out in a hut on the edge of town and that put us right in the middle of downtown so um, it almost gave me my opportunity to do the museum because the other museum had been Mrs. Rogers Museum which we're very thankful for that mm -hmm. uh, but we were able to when she stopped coming we were able to um, you know do a little more professional exhibits uh, come over and and nobody was happier for us than Mrs. Rogers okay. and um, we were able to open the museum in 2006, 2005 or 2006, but anyway, at the depot. And uh, the traffic was good. We had a wonderful opening, and, and they're, they're still doing pretty well today. But I, um, I got the opportunity after, it was almost after I got us to the, the depot and, and got everything up and running, it was, it was time to move. So at that time, the tourism directorship came open and since I had that experience from uh, years before and uh, the tourism office is in the same parking lot as the depot I, I said that when I got that opportunity I, I kept my, my my parking space and just moved over to another building and uh, we were able to really uh, work on tourism we of course with my background um, I really looked uh, at the Civil War and the culture heritage folks that were coming especially with the coming of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, uh, which we're still in. But of course, 1862 is the big year for this area. So we were able to do that. And, and I stayed at tourism for about five years. And then now I'm staying at home with my children and uh, teaching U.S. history. So uh, that's, that's my story. But along the way, uh, I think that uh, the wonderful characters mm -hmm. that are here in Corinth and Alcorn County uh, and even some of the, the surrounding areas, uh, they make this area very unique and there, there's lots of stories. Uh, Miss Rogers uh, told the stories going back to Jason. Uh, her grandfather was the sheriff there and uh, this is a story they tell on the tour. Uh, he actually got locked in the, the jail by a town drunk uh, the town drunk was, was up in the courtroom making faces at the judge, so the judge ordered him to be put in the jail. Uh, the sheriff, Davenport, Robert Davenport, went to put him in the jail, and uh, the guy said, there's snakes in there and spiders, and, and the sheriff said, well, I'll show you that it's okay. So he went to show him, and he slammed him in the jail. Uh, and jailed the sheriff and went back to the courtroom and started making faces and carrying on again so until somebody realized that the sheriff was in the jail so they they freed him uh, from that but that was um, Mrs. Rogers uh, so many great-grandfathers and her other great-grandfather um, actually had a meal at Bay Springs which is on the Tom Beebe River and uh, now it's underwater when they cut the, the Tom Beebe when they when they um, connected the Tom Bigby with the Tennessee River, um, that, that was flooded. So uh, that's, that was kind of lost. Um, also, Mrs. Rogers um, really studied the Civil War history of our area. And uh, I, I have a couple of, of I, the, the funniest Mrs. Rogers story was, uh, one of the funniest ones I can remember, is I, I referred to that uh, heater. And it was so loud that it sounded like a freight train. Well, Mrs. Rogers was so nice to, to everybody, but you know, when you get 90 years old, you can say anything to anybody, and it, they're pretty forgiving. And uh, there was a guy who came in, and he, 
and there were cases in the museum and a lot of times we would stand on one side of the case and we would talk to the visitor on the other side and, and you know discuss the items in the cases well this gentleman proceeded to tell us that he had been reincarnated several times and that he was actually um, a Roman soldier at the foot of the cross when when Christ was there and I was just looking at at this man like you know and Miss Rogers was just smiling and saying that's very interesting yes and just going on and on well you know try not to talk about visitors but you know when somebody says that they've had several lives um, you, you need to discuss that when they walk out the door and it was in the winter time so that heater was popping on and off and um when when he left i looked at mrs rogers and i said miss rogers that man was crazy i said did you uh i said and you just kept agreeing with him like yeah she went honey i didn't hear a damn word he said <laughs> So I ended up having to tell her the story, but um, and she was really bad about um, She would give uh, people tours. She and Mr. Horton both would take people out and uh, Give people access to Civil War sites that now they're accessible because of the National Park Service But back in in those days you had to know somebody to get back to see some of the earthworks and such and of course everybody would let Mr. Horton and, and Ms. Rogers go and and look around and uh she somebody would call and she would just hop in the car with them and go and uh i told her i said "Ms. rogers you need to be careful you need to kind of screen these people but um she would do it anyway and uh there was there was one gentleman that came in and he was about three sheets and she got in the car with him so i had to i had to threaten her <laughs> and tell her that i was going to call her son <laughs> if she didn't quit stop getting in the, in the cars she was so trusting and she loved to share her stories so much that uh, she would she would talk to anybody uh, and and we used to make fun of her because you know we would go two or three days without a without a visitor and then somebody would come in and I'd go oh no here's the next victim because they were going to be stuck for the next two hours because it'd been a couple of days since she had talked about it so she they were going to get the whole story so um, that even though I wasn't making a whole lot of money and the building was hot or the building was cold and there were bugs and you know everything. Um, those are some of my best memories in that little hut on the edge of town uh, for those years where all the uh, the characters would come in and, and like I said they would they would fuss with Miss Rogers over where something was or who somebody was. Um, another great contribution that Mrs. Rogers made was in the 80s she started doing oral histories and again that's um, I don't know if she had a recorder or not but she wrote everything down and uh, she, Mr. Rubel, which uh, they were, the Rubel family was a prominent Jewish family here in town. Um, she interviewed him. She interviewed several others and uh, just in on the yellow notebooks, legal pads full of these interviews. And um, when she passed away, her son didn't want them. So uh, I got them. And they're they're in my house, and um, I, I've been reading through them. Uh, hadn't gotten to as much since I've been reading at uh, teaching, but um, there's some wonderful stories uh, there where Mr. Rubel talks about the first museum that was here in Corinth. It was on Waldron Street. Here, um, Mr. Henry Moore, he traveled in Central and South America, and he brought back stuffed taxidermied animals on, from his hunts, and he uh, opened a museum. And uh, Mr. Rubel actually got to visit the museum and he told in detail about the parquet flooring, about the different types of, of animals. Uh, Mr. Moore also had property out where Hill and Dale Country Club is now and he would bring exo live exotic animals back. Um, and uh, he brought exotic birds. There were people who would make reports of these birds. That they would say, and I think some of the the birds co-mingled with the local birds. So we actually pr may have some <laughs> some special species of, out here. Mr. Moore had one of the first cars, and she would talk about how the the children would run beside the cars when he would he would drive to town, and uh, he he was a character. Uh, but we 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 give him credit for having the first museum here in town, and unfortunately, uh, his museum. Uh, uh, burned in the fire that they had and uh, everything was lost. So. Let's talk about history for a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, you studied American history I did. here in Mississippi. 
I did. Do you, how, how do you think studying um, American history prior to leading up to the Civil War in the South might differ from studying the same topic up north? Do you think it creates a separate uh, approach towards the, the study? Uh, well, it's funny you should ask because that's where we are in mm -hmm. our, our study. Um, we are um, out, uh, at the Civil War now. Um, it makes it a whole lot more personal mm -hmm. uh, because the um, for us, the war was here. And what I've been able to do since I, I have a lot of this local history in my head, so to speak, um, I've been able to integrate some of that into um, our studies. Um, but even, even uh, and I call them kids, even these 18 and 19 year olds, you can tell that some of them are probably more passionate or have heard stories from their ancestors or, you know, that have been handed down um, about what was going on. And there's, um, there are certain things in the book um, that it's fine to go by, you know, the compromises and the acts and things, but um, they also get into the sociology of it and, and the social history, and that's where my interest is as well. And, um, you know, they make the point that every white person in the South, want, they, 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 it was their American dream to have a slave. I don't believe that. In three words or less, what caused the Civil War? Polarization. Okay. Um, do the people you're teaching now, um, do they relate to the Civil War, first of all, as the Civil War, or was it the war between the states? There's a couple that is a war between the states. Um, I, I have a little gentleman who's actually a reenactor. Okay. And um, he's he's uh, he's really vocal about that. And then uh, I had a little gentleman that sat in the back that's from Tennessee, and we were talking about how Mississippi seceded, how they we called the convention in, in December, and then the secession was voted on in January, and he was like doing the, you know, and I don't know if that's, um, I would like to educate them more on, on really what happened. Um, the, the slave, the slavery issue, I think there was a lot of propaganda there. Um, the slavery issue, I think, fell under economic polarization because you had, um, the South was mainly uh, agriculture, the North had grown um, industrial, you know, industrial wise. So, but then you had the splitting of the politics, you had the churches splitting. So that's why I said polarization because you had all of these little cracks, uh, socially, economically, politically. Mm -hmm. Slavery wasn't as prevalent in Northern Mississippi, is that correct? As, no. as down south? Um, there w there's actually a study done, and I can't remember the guy who wrote the book, but it's in my thesis, um, and he used Tishomingo County as um, a reference as far as um, slavery. I think 3% of the people may have owned more than 100 slaves. Um, if there were slaves, they were the small. Uh, a lot of times um, the small farmers may have owned one or two slaves in that um, they worked side by sides with their slaves, um, or you brought, you might have had like a, a house butler or a, you know a housekeeper who was the slave at the time. But there were very few slaves uh, in this area, and and that has to do with geography. Uh, our geography here does not um, lend to huge plantations like you have in the Mississippi Delta and some other places. Okay. Are there African Americans in your class? There's two. Okay. Is there any sense of uh, differentiation as they talk about the history? Um, when girl, there's there's a, a girl and a, and a guy, and the girl is very quiet. Um, I think she's very moderate. Um, she's just happy to be in school, you know. She's a single mother working. I do have a, another gentleman who's, who's younger, and uh, um, actually, I... <laughs> He said the tone um, on the first day of the class because I played that we didn't start the fire, and uh, he said Martin Luther King's not there, 
And I said, well, you're going to have to take that up with Billy Joel. That's not my fault, you know. Um, so uh, every every little thing that, that comes across um, is very racially charged. But I think that's the age. Um, you know, we did the Salem witch trials. And, you know, you had the Haitian woman who was uh, Tatuba that was accused first and he said well why did they accuse a black woman first mm -hmm. well I don't know I wasn't in Salem at that time that's just the facts you know so um, I, we, we try to um, I try to make it and a lot of times the race issue I, I just just um, kind of skim over but it's gonna become an issue more so um, we the slavery chapter a couple of weeks ago and and I told him I was like you know not a lot of people or I told the whole class not a lot of people in this area own slaves mm -hmm. there just wasn't a whole lot of money you only had substance farmers so he came back and he said my grandma said that every white person owned a slave and I said my family didn't own slaves mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and they talked about you know calling calling white people crackers and clay eaters and white trash and I said you know when he came back and said you know my grandma said that everybody owned slaves I said well not my family obviously we were the white trash <laughs> because what they you know they didn't they didn't own slaves they didn't have enough money and and um I don't know that it was their American dream to own a slave I think their American dream was to raise their families have enough food for the t to put on the table and um you know maybe make a little money what I know this is before your time, but what's your understanding and impression of um, integration here in the, in the Corinth, northern Mississippi? From what I understood from Mrs. Rogers, because Mrs. Rogers was here uh, teaching school during mm -hmm. integration, so a lot of my my secondhand knowledge comes from from her and conversations with her um, because of the low population, and I think still. Um, the population, uh, the African American population um, in North in in Alcorn County, is ten to fourteen percent at the most, and it may be lower than that. I haven't looked at the census, but um, they had a pretty easy time. You didn't have the violence here that uh, you had in other parts of Mississippi and Alabama. Um, you had a very well respected uh, head of a principal of one of the schools, or he may have been some, but anyway. Uh, E.S. Bishop, and he pretty much came together and and told everybody, look, they've ordered us to do this. We're going to do this with dignity. He also, I think, preached. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, he brought the African-American community and the white community together. And um, from what I understand, integrating the schools w was without too much of a challenge. And, you know, you had some things happening, but um, there was a gentleman who was the the rail master who came into the depot and uh, was telling me that he was ordered to integrate the depot because the the depot is in the shape of an, an L. Sure. And um, one side you had the white waiting room and the ladies lounge, um, and then you had the ticket office, and then the other side you had the African American waiting room. So um, <clears throat> the ticket office, you know, there's on the white side, there's the big window with the little bars and, you know, r what you think of as the railroad ticket office. On the other side, there's a little square window, and that was for the black folks to buy their tickets. Uh, but a lot of times in the black folks waiting room, around here you had a lot of day laborers. And what the day, even, <laughs> it became kind of the hangout to where and it was somewhere warm to go in the winter uh, cooler to go in the summer so a lot of times your day laborers would congregate there in the waiting room at the uh, at the depot and then when people needed yard work or carpentry work or things like that they would come and hire the day laborers so when uh, they ordered the the depot integrated and the train master had to you know take down all the signs and such there were actually folks in the African American community who were not happy because they felt like they were losing their place to come to hook up with with their jobs. So uh, they he kept it open, but you know, of course, people could come and go. And even prior to that, uh, that area down around the depot has always been kind of the the, uh, the unemployment office. Uh, that and we have a little Elvis going on. <laughs> that's appropriate. You love uh, Elvis. <laughs> yeah, that's Elvis. Uh, 
Elvis has come to town. Yeah, again. Elvis is here with us, uh, and he's been in the courthouse anyway. So, uh, anyway, there's pictures of uh, of of Corinth where there was a split rail fence in front of the depot, and you have these African American gentlemen lined up on the fence, and uh, this is probably dates back to the 30s and 40s. And again, the white folks would come and uh, have day laborers, much like the immigrant workers do now. Uh, so that that was pretty much their unemployment <laughs> office there, and they would come and uh, get picked up for their for their jobs for the day. So um, that way that so going back to the integration, so that was pretty easy as well when they when they did that. And um, right now today, I, I know um, you don't you're not old enough to remember all of that. Does does that part of the history, and again, we're really interested in history. Does that in any way leave a footprint here today? The Are civil rights movement? All or? His, that part of history, of Mississippi's history, does it weigh on, on popular culture at all? No, okay. not as much. What is your overall impression of um, race relationships here now? I think it's good. Okay. Um, you don't you don't hear a, a lot of of things happening. Okay. Um, okay. Why is history? I, we're so into this, and you're into this. I, I've never been to a place where history is as important to people as it is here, and I don't. I, I know that um, Shiloh was here, but I don't sense that Shiloh was is driving that. There's so much interest in town history and when people came here. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's a town full of characters, you know, like walking in off the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same, uh, you, you got to meet, or I got to meet all of these characters, either through tourism, um, through uh, the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just a matter of pride in place. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you do have people that, you know, say, why do we live here? And they move away. but. Um, I think the ones who stay, um, they just, I don't know what it is, but there's just this, um, and I'm not so sure that it's pride, but it's almost like a storytelling thing, and it's something that links us all together, because if you have somebody talk about Roscoe Turner, people have heard Roscoe Turner stories handed down, uh, the Borums, you have those stories handed down, uh, you have stories of... Uh, Civil War soldiers and and families here, uh, so there's just this wonderful storytelling culture, uh, and um, in the schools here they don't have, uh, of course, you know, with the curriculum the way it is, but they do. Um, a lot of the teachers take local field trips to the museums and uh, the Civil War Interpretive Center, so the teachers seem to have an appreciation. Um, used to more so than now, but of course the schools. Are, are so stringent on these core curriculum points and things they can as much but I don't know there's just this sense of place it seems and uh, and crazy or not crazy uh, uh, there's there's always a story to tell and somebody has something something funny to tell uh, you know your Camille Mitchells you had uh, Bill McPeters who passed away recently I'm sure somebody's mentioned him uh, <laughs> As we, and there's a lot of eccentrics here as well, and I don't know if it's in the water or what. <laughs> but, uh, I think uh, you've defined it for us. This is a storytelling town, and more than anywhere I've ever been. And people don't meet a stranger either. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have taken uh, tourists and travel riders and such uh, all over town, and it doesn't matter where you go. Uh, if you sit next to somebody, they're going to say, hey, where are you from? And you can say, Seattle, Washington. And they'll say, well, did you know? You know, and, and they just start. And mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's very friendly as well. And, uh, you know, these days, uh, Corinth seems to embrace the folks uh, uh, who are from out of town more so than they did in the 1860s. Although, you know, the northern folks were here uh, for three years occupying Corinth and uh, made that part of what it is as well. One of our ancestors was here. See, there you Corinth. go. So that's how y'all got here is chasing an ancestor, right? Sure, but we're not armed. Well, so. very safe. So, because so, so, we like you armed with your pocketbook these days instead of a, a gun. That's true. <laughs> well, you guys shot our ancestors, but you made oh. it through. Well, 
there you go. But yeah, there's and and I think too going back to um, the the stories is that um, a lot of times and and there's other places too, but they seem to live the history like people know the um, the history of their homes. They know what happened there, um, and like even my family, um, like I said, poor poor farming families who've you know worked their way up uh, after after the farming went away, you know small-scale farming the factory and and you know you see the factory manufacturing and now that it's kind of going away here you, they're more into the service industries sure. so um but there's there's that sense of place as well that's wonderful and i think you find that in mississippi a lot well that see now you said you had no story to tell and that was wonderful well thank you uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to oh. have a question <laughs> no, my battery just died. It's battery just died. <laughs> He'll probably fall over any moment. <laughs> you might, I'm going to turn the camera off. Sure. You don't, you might, it's okay for me to do that. And you do understand I was recording. Yes, I, I did. I had your permission to do that. You did indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.